Hello ladies and gentlemen, happy belated Halloween to you all. In today's episode we take a look at one of my favourite games from my childhood. Destroy All Humans, a game developed by Pandemic Studios who you may know for the Star Wars Battlefront series and published by THQ. This cult classic PS2 Xbox title was a huge part of my childhood and to my utter shock and delight it's getting remade in 2020, something I'd never thought possible. Destroy All Humans sets itself in 1950 at the tail end of the Red Scare, with movies such as Invasion of the Body Snatchers and Plan 9 from Outer Space acting as the basis for its satire. You play as Crypto Spiridion 137 from a race known as Furont. Your commanding officer, Orthopox 13, sends Crypto down to Earth in the hopes of finding his clone, Crypto 136, who goes MIA. Prolonged exposure to their own nuclear weaponry caused their genes to mutate. Therefore, they can no longer procreate because they lack the tools necessary. Instead, the Furons opt to clone themselves, however, the DNA they use to do so continually degrades after each clone. It's your job to not only find 136, but also to recover and extract the pure Furon DNA locked within the human brain. Yeah, in this universe, we're actually the descendant of some horny aliens. Who knew? You do realise that the catalyst for this entire game is literally just penis envy. Hashtag relatable, am I right? Throughout your quest to enforce your benevolent dictatorship, you'll butt heads with many a foe, including the entire US Army and the ever so shady Majestic Agents. The mission will start off fairly small scale, burning down a carnival, disguising yourself as the town mayor to brainwash them with bullshit. Later on, you get to enact more extreme measures, such as spoon feeding them subliminal messaging through the power of TV and movies. Who watches this shit? All the while, the people in charge try desperately to cover up and scapegoat any alien conspiracies. Of course, the irony in all this is that they themselves are doing underground experiments on the remains of 136, unbeknownst to the general public. Destroy Humans shows us that even if the paranoid premonitions of the 1950s were to come to life, how wholly unequipped we would be to deal with them. Despite the fact that Crypto is your one note clear cut bloodthirsty killer, the Majestic are shown to be just as despicable in some cases. Drugging America's food supplies to make them hostile xenophobes and planting subliminal messages in their Hollywood flicks. I mean, I've no idea what colour a cow's supposed to be, but there is a lot of political commentary you could take away from this game. I'm not going to touch that minefield personally, but it's not exactly hidden. You know, it occurs to me, maybe we shouldn't be messing with nuclear explosives. Maybe we're not ready. Maybe man wasn't meant to flirt with his own annihilation in such a cavalier way without having developed the ethical maturity to use- Destroy Humans is not what I'd call a very deep or thought-provoking game though. It wants to make you laugh first and think third. This is one funny game. Everything, and I do mean everything, has something to say via the Cortex scan, providing many hilarious lines. I wonder what my messy thinks about becoming beefsteaks in a supermarket someplace. Mmm, steak. Uh-oh, what do I do with my gun? It's not in my holster, not in my pants. Oh, it's in my hand. I have a rifle. Her name is Sue. Feeling he's gonna to serve and protect, to serve and protect, to serve and protect, to swerve and defect, oh, to curve and perfect. Damn it, I lost it. Enlighten me, poultry people. <laughs> My perceptional life has just been turned on its head. I think what sells this game for me is the atmosphere. I've never really played anything like it. Not even its sequel, despite the fact that I think it's a much funnier and better game overall. It lacks the stronger identity that this game has. This game was late into the PS2's life cycle, so what we get here is a really good looking game for its time. It's not quite realistic, but it's not quite cartoony either. It's perfect for selling that uncanny B-movie feel. 
When you're blending in with human folk, the area's theme switches to a slightly more subdued, yet unnerving version of the track. You feel like an animal, stalking your prey, waiting for just the right moment. The overly paranoid behaviours of this era are truly brought to life with this soundtrack. It's one of those aspects that I never really took the time to appreciate until I got the chance to think about it with this video. Make no mistake though, its roots may come from horror, but DAH is not a scary game. That couldn't be any more apparent than with the main character, Cryptosporidium. A short, dorky, Jack Nicholson-like alien who is low-key one of my favourite protagonists in all of video games. J. Grant Albert's performance as Crypto is what I think of when I think of Destroy All Humans. He, along with Pox, voiced by Richard Horvitz, hype themselves up to be this ultra-intelligent race and yet are flawed by mundane concepts such as TV and radio. Despite being a power-hungry sadist, Crypto's attempts at persuasion just make him out to be this lovable, albeit dangerous, dork. And don't you dare call him green. To ensure this invasion runs smoothly, it is imperative we identify the dominant life forms on this world. Those lactating bovoids are likely candidates. Surely you don't mean those foul-smelling gas bags beyond the fence. Yes, I'm afraid I do. But they're covered in nipples. Now, Cryptosporidium! The game takes place in a magical land called... Earth, with over 25 unique missions for you to complete over six different hub worlds. Turnipseed Farm, Rockwell, Santa Modesta, Area 42, Union Town, and Capital City, all various parodies of places in America. Turnipseed Farm is your designated tutorial level. There's not much to explain here, but hey, at least the locals are friendly. Earth creature, I am addressing you. Respond or be vaporized. <laughs> Crypto has quite a lot of firepower for something so small. He has a jetpack that will propel him pretty far and is your best way to travel. Crypto also has a wide variety of mental abilities. All of these can be used by holding the right trigger and pressing the corresponding face buttons. Of course, we've already familiarised ourselves with the Cortex scan. Psychokinesis allows you to pick up and throw cars, cattle and just, well, whatever takes your fancy. Suck it, Silver! Seriously, this is how Sonic 06 should have been. Hypnosis is mostly used to perform context sensitive actions, however you can also use it to cause distractions, more on that in a bit. Downed humans can have their brains extracted, which you can then take back to Pox's lab to up your arsenal. The Holobob allows you to mirror the appearance of a targeted human. All of these abilities run on your concentration meter. This is especially important to keep an eye on during stealth based missions. In order to refill it you need to use the Cortex scan, so just make sure you keep an eye on that. But I know what you're thinking, what about weapons? Well don't worry friend, because there's no end to them, and by that I mean there's four of them. The Zapomatic is an ammo-less weapon that can hold an enemy in place, but not much else. The Anal Probe forces your enemies to shit themselves to death and extracts their brain automatically. The Disintegrator Ray, aka Best Girl, is a machine gun capable of turning the opposition into ashes. Finally, the Ion Detonator is by far the most powerful weapon in your inventory and is the ideal choice for taking out larger threats such as tank and mech walkers. It's also the only weapon that can cause recoil damage should you get caught in the blast radius. 
Yeah, crypto isn't a very durable little alien. Falling damage, gunshots, tanks, they all draw a number on our little green man. And if you're not careful, you'll be sent back to the cloning chamber in no time. And don't you dare go near water. Crypto's allergic to that stuff. It's poisonous. Every time you die, you get sent back to the mothership and cloned, essentially answering the age-old question of how does the protagonist come back after dying? Your waypoints are also beacons beamed down from the mothership. It's very organic, I love that. Destroy Humans is an open-world, destruction-centric sandbox. Your task is to simply cause as much destruction as possible. Because... As you do, the game will react by spawning more powerful enemies relative to the amount of destruction you do. To start, all nearby authorities will try and apprehend you, followed by the police, then the army, and finally the boys in black. The ability to pilot a UFO is arguably one of the defining features of the Straw Humans. It also has a weapon library of its own. The Death Ray is a rechargeable weapon that can tear through anything in its path. The Sonic Boom is a rapid fire machine gun type weapon that can propel enemies and objects into the air, assisting with crowd control. Then there's your Quantum Deconstructor, a nuclear weapon with a wide area of effect, obliterating anything that gets caught in the crossfire. It doesn't have much ammo, but you won't need much ammo with this. There's also the Abducto Beam, which takes the award for most useless weapon in video game history. If I wanted to split up a horde of tanks, I'd just use something like the Sonic Boom. Saucer combat is actually something I prefer in this first game over its sequel. It's so much faster, and you can strafe on a dime, ducking and weaving between oncoming fire. But apart from destroying humans, what do you do in a game called Destroy All Humans? Well, I'm glad you asked. Going into an invasion site with a green marker will immediately start a mission. A lot of the missions here are very basic. Go here, kill this thing, go kidnap this person. There are a few exceptions and we'll get to those, but for the most part, the structure of the missions won't blow your mind. The alert system, however, plays a much bigger role than shit's about to go down. The majority of the missions have certain stipulations. Say, for example, you're going up against General Armquest, you can't alert the military. The holobob is needed to blend in with human activity. The majestic agents, however, have the ability to jam your holobob, and by the end of the game, they themselves blend in with the rest of the human bystanders. You need to pay close attention to your minimap and plan out your route accordingly, so you don't accidentally get your cover blown. Or you could just use a distraction. Yeah, this stealth is pretty flawed. Once you know to do this, it takes a fairly challenging stealth section and breaks it in half. I suppose I should be thankful, because if you don't know that, this game can actually be pretty tough. Dying in missions kicks you back to the mothership, forcing you to do it all over again. If you think you can just cheese the mission with the saucer, it, nah. You're only allowed to use the saucer when you're told you can. You're not allowed to think for yourself on what the best solution might be. I will say though, Destroy Humans is actually a great game to speedrun. In instances where you need to follow X, Tim Ford, Individual, or find the password for Y, you can just go straight there if you have prior knowledge or have done the mission before. A lot of these missions are fairly short too, so you really don't have to redo all that much if you fail. The majority of the time spent in each mission is just simply gathering intel. Once you've done that bit, you've pretty much won half the battle. Right, yeah, good stuff, got it. Believe it or not, I do like this game. I just have a habit of being cynical with my childhood favourite because I don't want people to call me biased. I'm not, you are, shut up. Citizen Crypto is the third mission in the game and is arguably where things start to pick up in terms of difficulty. Not only are you introduced to the majesty that is... Radioactive exploding zombie cows! But this is also your first mission with a degree of non-linearity. You're given the task of posing as the Rockwell Mayor to brainwash the town. From there, you're given various options as to how to persuade them, and it's your job to choose the correct one. You really have to take into account what sort of time period you're in. It's unfortunate that you can't replay any completed missions, since there's a lot of funny and correct options that you won't get to see if you're just doing it properly. Whatever happened to 136 is another highlight, since it's the entire reason you got dragged to Earth in the first place. The mission starts with you paying a visit to the oh-so-familiar crash site from the intro, where you find nothing but a single saucer fragment. These will act as breadcrumbs, slowly leading you to a massive military complex, where 136 is being held. 
as soon as you collect the first piece, you already know what's about to happen. You know the outcome. This isn't going to end well. What you find is the dissected remains of 136 being used to unlock human potential. Because, you remember part alien? It then turns this game into a really cliche, funny, family revenge plot. Oh, oh I, lo I, love th I love this game so much. By far the best mission in the game has to go to Furon Down, your first mission in Union Town. Your sorcerer is gunned down and you're taken hostage. Stripped of most of your equipment, you must fight your way off the island intact. You could hypnotise the scientist to let you out, or you could just do it yourself with your PK. Before you get your saucer back, you must find your way onto the island where the crash took place. What you're intended to do is find a password to gain access to the barge and just straight up take you there. Unlike other missions however, killing the designated NPC does not result in a failure state. Your jetpack is put in a separate location and you're forced to go through a separate platforming section instead. The design here is nothing spectacular, however, the game could have benefited with more missions like Furon Down. What about the bad missions though? Duck and Cover. In this mission, you're expected to drag a nuke to the Area 42 airstrip in the hopes of taking out General Armcrest. Yeah, these Furons don't fuck about. It's not a hard mission, it's just slow. Very, very slow. Like, if you hate escort missions, this is pretty much the bottom of the barrel. Oh look, there's some shit blocking the road. What in the world will I do? I'll just move that over here, move that over here. There we go. Oh god damn it! And if you die, you have to do the thing all over again. In this mission, you're tasked with protecting the Santa Modesta radio towers so the presenter you kidnapped can broadcast your fake peace message. This might sound doable in your saucer. Too bad you don't get to use your saucer. Your boy Crypto may be packing some significant heat, but a couple of tank shots and he's gone. Also robots. You know, like in the 50s. Contrary to what some of you might be thinking, you don't just go from mission to mission. No, that, no, that, that, that would be logical. Instead, after every mission, you go back to your mothership and select the next mission. Don't, don't, don't seem so bad. Why, why, why are you making such a big deal out of this, Jack? Well, if said mission takes place in a new invasion site, you need to pass a certain DNA threshold. You aren't given a reason why, and honestly, it just adds nothing to the game and simply pads it out for no reason. Supposedly, they make you do this so you have enough for upgrades to make the missions less brutal. But there's a problem with that line of thought. When I said you need to pass a certain DNA threshold, I didn't mean just collect 1000 DNA and you're good to go, no. If you already have that amount when going to a new invasion site, you can just go there right away. So here lies the conundrum. Do you go without upgrades and make missions harder for yourself, or get upgrades and waste time grinding? That's not even mentioning the fact that there's a whole mission dedicated to just grinding brain stems. There are a couple of things you can do to make the process less painful, like these alien probes which give you 75 DNA apiece. And then there's the side missions, which I'm just gonna say, these, these are bad. A lot of the objectives are shared between hub worlds, racing to the checkpoints, kill X amount of NPCs. They do get progressively harder each time you complete them, and you do get a bigger payout for doing so, but they're just busy work, they barely meet the criteria needed to be considered a side mission. Bosses are another area where destroy all humans kind of misses the mark. There are three of them, General Armquist is probably the best one out of the lot. A lot of the missions in the latter half of the game, including the aforementioned duck and cover, is dedicated to taking him down. So when you do finally catch up to him and pump him full of plasma, it's satisfying as all hell. The bosses all face one major problem, and that is they can be exploited to the point where they're just pathetic. The fight against the robo Prez, while a funny what the fuck moment, stops being funny when you realise he barely takes any damage from your weapon of choice. By the time you get to fighting Silhouette, you don't want to go through that shit again, so yet yeah, you're gonna cheese it. Taken on their own, they aren't bad fights, it's just if you know of an exploit, you're gonna use it. Should you want more bank for your buck, there are plenty of cool extras to keep you occupied. Collecting the alien probes will net you some early concept art, neat stuff. 
but on top of that beating the game rewards you with a whole bunch of promotional material as well as a full feature of Plan 9 from Outer Space and Teenagers from Outer Space, two movies that acted as heavy inspiration for the game's development. Last but certainly not least, there's the developer Darwism, a short documentary starring a couple of the game's devs, showcasing the game's various builds throughout the stages of its life and how that influenced the final game. This is awesome, I wish game companies weren't always so secretive about stuff like this, because this is just cool, I love it. I hope it comes back in the remake. So that was Destroy All Humans, it's aged, honestly some parts of the game aren't really designed that well at all, but it's my childhood damn it so shut up. Like I said it has a certain charm and atmosphere that no other game to this point has yet to replicate for me. There's a reason why it's considered a cult classic by many. It has a pretty endearing premise and the writing is still plenty funny 15 years later. You can play it on both the PS4 and Xbox One for fairly cheap so give it a chance and have some fun. Although, just to warn you, the PS4 version does have a few graphical oddities, so definitely go with the Xbox version if you can. It also got a sequel, which in my opinion is miles better, and also happens to be one of my favourite games of all time, perhaps another day. It's also worth reiterating that the game is getting remade in early 2020, which, in my humble fanboy opinion, is looking fantastic. I'll be sure to revisit this game when that comes out. Till next time, folks. Have a good day.